Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I would think that if you were a non-English speaking person, it would be really difficult to learn our language. There are so many exceptions to the rule. Uh, take, for instance, these words right here. To me, if I were non-English, I would think that they would all rhyme, right? But do, tough, bow, cough. All the different changes in exception in our language. And then after you learn that, then you have to learn all the idiomatic phrases. Like, um, let me put a bug in your ear. Or, it's raining cats and dogs. Uh, every cloud has a silver lining. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. What? What? You're going to put an insect in my ear canal? What? You're going to do what with a baby? And every cloud has what kind of precious metal? You see, it's got to be confusing. And yet, those symbolic phrases, those words, that may be cryptic at first, actually point to a deeper, richer meaning. Like when we talk about heaven. We are uh, wrapping up our three-part sermon series called, What is Heaven Like? All Saints Sunday, we talked about a reunion for all the saints who from their labors rest. Last week, it was restoration a time in which every tear will be wiped away, death will be restored or de defeated, and we will come full circle back into that shalom of the Garden of Eden. And today, today we're taking a look at Revelation. Not so much the book, though we'll talk about that, but how God has revealed what heaven is like. And God has spoken a lot about heaven and at the same time, not too much. A lot of it is wrapped up in these phrases and symbolic language that we have to unpack. Like some of the words that Barbara was reading here today from Revelation. It says this, The holy city has a great high wall with twelve gates. On the east, three. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. The east. So, so the first thing is about this, this heaven has all these different gates, all almost like a castle. But what is this point beyond? What's the symbolic language saying? Is that there's entry. Uh, not in a hidden way, but all four compass points. There are three gates that are open. It is a welcoming place from people coming from all directions. What else does it say? The angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. And he measured and found it was square. The city is square. And how? As wide as it is long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. I had to convert 12,000 stadia. 1,400 miles. It's like New York to Kansas. And it's a big square. Does that mean that heaven is going to be like a huge metropolitan like New York City? No. What's this pointing beyond? It's going to be big. It's going to be big enough for all. It's going to be big enough for you. There is plenty of space in God's kingdom. What else does it say? Then he measured the wall and found them to be 216 feet thick. Really? Heaven has this wall here that's 216 feet? Why? Now, what's that pointing beyond? What's this symbolic um, meaning? And of course, what it means is that it will be safe. The walls are so thick, nothing can breach these walls. It's about security. You're going to be safe. And what's more, 
more, the wall was built of jasper, the city pure gold, clear as glass. The foundation of the wall, the city adorned with every jewel from jasper, the second sapphire, agate, and emerald. And the street of the city is pure gold. Really, we're going to have all these jewel-encrusted walls? We're going to be walking on 24 carat gold? No, no. But what does that point beyond? That this place will be of immeasurable wealth, extravagance, beauty beyond anything you've ever experienced before. (coughs) And finally... And the city has no moon, no need of, no city has no need of sun or moon. For the glory of God illuminates the city and the Lamb is its lamp. So is it going to be like (laughs) bright, bright lights the whole time up in heaven? That you have to buy those blackout shades to be able to sleep? No, no, don't take it too literally. Just means the presence of God is there. And in a time in which there were no flashlights or electricity or light bulbs, the darkness was a scary place. Things, bad things, happen in the night. But here in heaven, it's going to be open for all people, 12 gates. It's going to be beautiful beyond measure, extravagant. It's going to be safe. And the presence of God will be among us. There'll be no things that go bump in the night. Now that kind of talks a little bit about heaven itself. But what do we know about the relationship that we will have with God at that time? And for that, I want to turn to that John 21 text that I read here just moments ago. So the uh, the setting here is that Jesus has died, was risen again. He appeared to the disciples in the locked upper room. And then there's a gap. We don't know how long of a gap, but it's a long enough gap that the disciples think, I guess we're done. And it begins this way. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, And he showed himself in this way. Gathered together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. And here it is. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. Now, this this is not sitting at the riverbank with a cane pole and a bobber with a six-pack of whatever you want and hoping the fish don't bother you. This is commercial fishermen, right? In other words, what Simon Peter is saying, that I guess guess we're done. I guess it was a great three-year run. Jesus is gone. Who knows where he is? I guess we just go back to what we know. We go back to fishing. And Peter is not alone with that. They said to him, we'll go with you. So they go up to Galilee there. And they revert back to their old lives. It says they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. That's the way they typically fished back then. They went out at night to fish. And, uh, but even these skilled fishermen, perhaps after three years of not doing it, lost their touch. Probably not. So they're defeated, and then just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. This is dawn. Dawn, and the sun is beginning to rise. But the disciples did not know it was Jesus. We don't know why. Maybe because of the uh, dimly lit morning that they can't really see who it is. Maybe Jesus somehow is um, uh, masking himself so they doesn't read. Who knows? But they don't know it is Jesus. And Jesus says to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? Now we we do that, don't we? When we walk down the beach, when we're at the the river or lake, and somebody's fishing, caught anything? 
Are they biting? What are they biting on? But this one's a little different, isn't it? Jesus knows. Jesus knows. You don't, you don't have any fish, do you? They answered him, no, no. So here is Jesus on the shore. They are tired after working all night long. They could have very easily just said, well, we'll do this again tomorrow and see what happens. But Jesus says to them, cast your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find them. They could have blown off this stranger. We fish this water. We are fishermen. This is not a hobby for us. But they do it. So they cast it. And now they're not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. Wow. That's got to get your attention, right? And I love this next line. That disciple whom Jesus loved, <laughs> that's code. That's code for John, the author. John is way too modest to say, I am the one. John, no, no, I'll just say... You know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which everybody knows he loved me best. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to the Peter, said to Peter, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. See, Peter wants you to know that he knew it was the Lord first. Even though Peter got to be the first pope, you know, he, John knew that this was Jesus first. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had taken it off and jumped into the sea. That's a little odd, isn't it? Most people take off some clothes before they go swimming. He puts on that large outer toga to jump in because, you know, they're all stripped down to their skivvies to be able to work and fish. He puts on clothes. I mean, it could just be that this whole, I don't know, modesty. He doesn't want to stand before the Lord in his underwear. That could be. But he, he dresses and jumps into the water, and he swims. But the other disciples, see, the other disciples know a good thing when they see it. They've got a net full of big, large fish. That's probably the biggest haul they've ever seen. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of, of fish. Now let me stop there a second. When's the last time Jesus went fishing with the disciples? When's the last time he said, well, go cast your net over on that side? When's the last time that the nets were so full that they were beginning to break? The very beginning of the Gospels, at the call of the disciples, when Jesus meets them for the first time, and uh, overwhelms them with that catch of fish. And remember his saying that, oh, you think this is impressive. I'm going to send you out to be fishers of people. And now it's happening again, a second time, as if these dull-witted disciples just need a second lesson. They need a reminder that there is something greater at stake than a haul of fish. So they come in dragging the fish. They weren't far off from the land, only about 100 yards, which is a long ways to swim with a large toga, isn't it? But Peter makes it in. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there. Let's pause for a moment. You know our rule of thumb here at Christ Lutheran, the details matter. Now, I love a backyard fire as much as the next person. But this is not one of those roaring ones that you're starting up. It's not one that you're throwing additional uh, logs on because the guests are over. You've got to build it back up. Charcoal. Which suggests what? Jesus has been there for a while. The fire has been there for a while. Much like what Jesus said back in John 14, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And when the time is right, we'll be together. This is not something thrown together haphazardly last minute. Jesus is preparing a place, the charcoal fire. And he brings his own fish and his bread as well. 
and in some ancient um, um, mosaics or paintings, oftentimes the Last Supper is seen with fish and bread. Could this be kind of a glimpse? We always talk about communion being the foretaste of the feast to come. This is the feast. This is what they've been given a glimpse of all the time they receive communion. This is the feast. It's not much. A little bit of bread, a little bit of fish. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Never mind, Jesus has plenty of fish and plenty of bread. So Simon Peter went abroad and, and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Let's stop there. The rule of thumb, details matter, 153. That's pretty specific, isn't it? And yet John doesn't give us an explanation. Why 153? So this past week, I had to do a bunch of research. Why 153? I had one article that took a look at that mathematical formula of pi and all the different ways and the formulas, and they went through like 10 different mathematical equations and how the common number of all of that was 153. And so I threw that page away because I didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> the other one that I thought made sense was that at that time, there were 153 known varieties of fish. And as Jesus, at the beginning of the, uh, of the gospel, say, I'm going to make you now fishers of men, of the world. And as Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, as the imagery and revelation suggests, there are going to be 12 there are going to be 12 gates on all four compass points. This is a place that the whole world is being gathered in. I like that one better. This represents one of every kind in the whole world. And the next line is even better. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. There's plenty of room. Go into all the world, teach, preach, and baptize. This heaven is from New York to Kansas City. It's a huge square. There's plenty of room. There's plenty of room. The gates are wide open. It's being a welcoming place. Come on in. So Jesus then says to them, come and have breakfast. I have prepared a place for you. This is very intentional. I've been waiting. But with a charcoal fire, and a meal to welcome you after your long labor. Come, eat, rest. Come to the place that you know that you are welcomed and you belong. I love this next line. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, And who are you again? Because they knew. Because they knew it was the Lord. And all those questions, all those questions they've always had, all those questions, who sinned that this man was born blind, his parents or him? All this, these questions, who, who is able to speak and the wind and the rain obey his command? All these questions. Who is able to forgive sins? All those questions, all those doubts, all those denials, all those struggles that these disciples have had in the presence of God for three years, they're suddenly completely gone. Like all those questions that you and I might have. What about the problem of suffering? What about all that hunger? What about war? How do I know the Bible is true? What good is prayer? All those questions, all those doubts, all those concerns. When you finally get to that shore lunch, your response is going to be, oh, because you're going to know. 
You're going to know it's the Lord. Is heaven really going to be full of streets paved with gold and jewel-encrusted walls? No. No. It's pointing to a higher reality, a beauty and extravagance beyond our imagination. Is is heaven really going to be like a, a huge metropolitan place that goes from New York to Kansas City? No. No. It's going to be a welcoming place. Gates on all compass points. There's going to be room. Is heaven really going to be like a shore lunch after fishing all night with Jesus on the beach? No. No. But what does that point to? What greater reality? That's the break of a new day. After toiling not just one night, but our entire lives, after toiling our entire lives, there will be the break of that new day, of that final day, in which when we get there, we know that there has been a place prepared for you and me. And what's the best part is that we will be with our Savior face to face. And all those silly questions that you've been holding on in your heart, all that silly nonsense about, I got a couple of questions for Jesus when I see him, they're going to be chucked out the window. Because on that day, they won't matter. And you'll say, oh, and you will know. You will just know it is the Lord. The Bible says a lot about heaven, and at the same time doesn't say much. But what it does say is enough that it is a place for you, that God has loved you so much that he has prepared a place And when you get there, you know that he has prepared it especially for you. Thanks be to God. Amen.